Evie was born and raised in a village. Family was central to her life. Her mother worked on the farm her whole life, while her father worked as a driver. Since they were young, Evie and her sister Nina helped around the house, doing chores, cooking, and taking care of the animals. Their parents were busy earning a living, so the girls took care of them when they came home tired in the evening, setting the table and pouring tea. It was their daily routine. From a young age, Evie dreamed of becoming a teacher, influenced in part by her first teacher, Miss Taryn. Miss Taryn was a beautiful and intelligent young woman who had recently graduated from college. She spoke eloquently and calmly, knew the answers to all the questions, and motivated the class to excel in their studies. So, Evie was determined to become a teacher just as good and kind as her favorite teacher. The girl excelled in her studies and easily gained admission to pedagogical college after finishing school. Thus began her life in the city. Evie was assigned a room in the dormitory, which was a new experience for her. She had never been away from her parents and sister for longer than a couple of days, and suddenly she was on her own. At first, it was scary and challenging, but Evie quickly adapted. She enjoyed her studies, made friends with classmates, and respected her teachers. It became increasingly clear to her that she had chosen the right path, being a teacher was truly her calling. After graduating, Evie got her first job. She was hired at a prestigious language gymnasium. The salary they offered was beyond her wildest dreams. Evie immersed herself in her work. She enjoyed teaching, answering the students' numerous questions, preparing lesson notes, and participating in pedagogical councils. The young professional started receiving compliments from experienced colleagues, and that brought her joy. By that time, Evie's sister Nina had also moved to the city. Nina graduated from the College of Economics, found a job at a meat processing plant in the administrative department, and then got married to Phil, the son of the plant director. Perhaps his parents were at first against the bride, a simple girl from the village, but after getting to know Nina better, they loved and accepted her. She was beautiful, hardworking, faithful, and kind. The young couple lived in their own apartment, which had three spacious rooms and a huge balcony. Evie sincerely rejoiced in her sister's happiness. However, her own personal life was not going well. During her college years, Evie had several unsuccessful romances. All her suitors were immature, self-centered, dependent, and weak. Evie knew she couldn't build a life with someone like that. The bitterness and disappointment from each breakup lingered for a long time. That's why Evie decided to take a break from romantic relationships and focus on her career. After all, men had brought her a lot of frustration, and it was better to concentrate on her professional growth. And then, one day, a man named Phil entered the young teacher's life. He was a modest, somewhat reserved, and short guy with blue eyes and a pleasant smile. They first crossed paths in the school gymnasium at the end of summer. Phil was leading a team of craftsmen who were hurriedly completing repairs at the school. Their eyes met, and Evie immediately sensed that there was something about this man who captivated her. She couldn't quite put her finger on it. He wasn't particularly handsome and seemed quiet and unremarkable, but he blushed and turned away when he saw Evie, clearly embarrassed. It was a very endearing and touching sight. Evie realized that he had also been attracted to her at first sight. From then on, Evie would see Phil every day, and he would always avoid eye contact with her. However, the young woman began to notice that he would secretly steal glances at her when he thought she wasn't looking. It was both pleasant and exciting. One day, Phil mustered up the courage to take a leap of faith. It was the eve of completing a project, their last opportunity to get to know each other with no more school work to keep them connected. Phil feared he wouldn't see Evie again, so he decided to take a desperate and challenging step. Phil spoke quietly and simply, without flowery phrases, but his words were sincere and touching. Evie was touched by his honesty, and she agreed to go on a date with him. Little did Phil know, she had been eagerly waiting for this invitation, and the thought of not receiving it had started to worry her. For their first date, Phil invited Evie to the movies, and after that day, Evie realized that Phil was the one for her. They were so good, so easy together. 
and, of course, they shared stories about their lives. Phil had been raised by his grandmother since his parents passed away when he was only six years old. Growing up with his elderly grandmother, she was a lady of the old school and believed that children should be brought up in strictness, especially boys. Therefore, Phil's childhood couldn't be described as happy, warm, or carefree. But he didn't complain to Evie about it, he simply shared how he grew up. Evie, being sensitive and attentive, drew her own conclusions. She felt sorry for this amazing guy and wanted to give him warmth and care, which he lacked in his childhood. She longed to hug him and kiss him. After finishing school, Phil joined the army and later studied to become a welder. Although he didn't get a job in his chosen field, he became a foreman of a repair team, which provided him with a steady income nonetheless. Phil never gave up the idea of becoming a welder. Welders were usually offered higher wages, and he had to put in so much effort into learning the profession. Phil lived in a rented apartment, just like Evie when he was still a child. Cunning relatives sold off his parents' house, leaving him with nothing. He had to start from scratch, but he never lost hope or complained about life. Even though fate hadn't treated him fairly, Phil was kind and caring. Unlike Evie's previous boyfriends, Phil always made sure she wasn't hungry, and he would offer her his jacket on cool evenings to keep her warm. With Phil, Evie felt loved and desired. It was a wonderful feeling. Evie realized she was in love, and her feelings were mutual, there was no doubt about it. Phil looked at her with adoring eyes and did everything in his power to make her feel comfortable and happy around him. When Phil proposed, Evie happily accepted without any surprise. She had longed to be with Phil, to take care of each other and support one another. She was tired of returning to an empty, cold room. At first, Nina wasn't thrilled about her sister's choice. You're young, beautiful, you can easily find someone even wealthier. My Phil has many friends, and all of them are handsome and sons of rich parents. You'll roll in the stuff with them. And what about Phil? No home, no money, no normal job. But after getting to know Phil better, Nina changed her opinion. He's a good man, Nina smiled, sharing her impressions with Evie. He's very kind, and he loves you so much. You'll be fine, and you'll achieve everything together. You shouldn't let go of such a man. I'm so happy for you. Soon, Phil and Evie got married and started living in his rented apartment. It was a golden time for Evie. Her husband did everything he could to help her. He found a new job as a welder on a construction site to get more money. He also took on additional part-time jobs, never turning down an opportunity to earn some extra money. He had his sights set on buying their own house in a prestigious neighborhood with good schools and playgrounds to ensure a happy childhood for their future children. Phil would often surprise his young wife for no reason at all. He would give her a ring or come home with a bouquet. Evie felt incredibly happy and thanked fate for sending her such a loving and caring husband. The young couple would spend hours talking about various topics, discussing movies, life stories of friends and relatives, and making plans. Sometimes they would argue, but they always managed to find a compromise in the end. They both introduced each other to new and interesting things. For example, Evie got interested in hiking in the forest with Phil, and Phil fell in love with the theater thanks to his young wife. Evie believed that she and Phil were soulmates, two halves of a whole. Although the couple were not wealthy, they had enough to live comfortably. They didn't have luxury cars or annual trips to the sea, but they were content with what they had. And then, Roger was born. The young couple rejoiced at his arrival. Phil, as a new father, was beaming with pride as he held his son for the first time. He proved to be a wonderful parent, attentive, sensitive, and caring. After work, he would spend hours strolling around the neighborhood with his baby to give Evie a break. But, of course, mostly Evie would go for walks with Phil, enjoying their conversations about their plans for the future. They didn't have their own place yet, but their savings were slowly growing. They knew that they would be able to afford their own place soon. The young couple often dreamed about their son's future as well. They hoped he would grow up to be smart and kind. 
As parents, they were going to do their best to nurture their son's innate talents and support him through every challenge. But the couple's dreams were not destined to come true. A few years after the birth of their son, misfortune started to fall on their small family one after another. First came the financial crisis, which caused the couple's savings to depreciate. They had nothing left to buy their own apartment, even though the goal was so close. The couple had a difficult time coping with what had happened. They even cried, unable to hide their emotions. Phil couldn't hold back his tears, thinking that his wife didn't see. He had even picked out a house of his dream with three bedrooms not far from a great school and a sports center where Roger could go swimming. And then, such a blow. But there was no time to dwell in despair for long. Hard times arrived. Evie's salary at school was reduced, and things were not going well at the construction site either, Phil's main source of income. Now, Phil's income came from private construction jobs. He would disappear all day long, working part-time to support his family. Time passed, Roger grew up, and it was time for him to start first grade. The family seemed to have adapted to the new conditions, hopes for a better life started to emerge, with a happy future on the horizon. Unfortunately, tragedy struck at the construction site. Phil worked unofficially, the construction site owners cut costs and didn't prioritize safety despite knowing the risks. Phil was always cautious and acted carefully. However, during the construction of a supermarket building, he tragically fell from the roof onto the concrete blocks below. Paramedics arrived and confirmed his death. Evie received the devastating news the next morning. Her world broke down. She didn't want to live, and she didn't understand why she had to get up in the morning if the closest and dearest person was gone. Evie realized that she would never meet anyone like Phil again. There simply weren't such people anymore. And she didn't need anyone else. She longed for his smile, his gaze, and the warmth of his presence. The inability to embrace her loved one was physically painful. Phil's belongings, clothes, books, glasses, surrounded her, but he would never come home again, never hug her or their son, or joke with them. How could she bear it? To numb the pain, Evie turned to alcohol. She knew it was a dead-end path, but at that moment, she didn't care. She just wanted to escape the unbearable pain, even if only for a moment. It's unclear what would have happened to Evie if it hadn't been for Nina. She took Roger in for a while, seeing that Evie couldn't even take care of herself, let alone her child. Evie didn't care, unfortunately. She was so immersed in her grief that she didn't even think about the feelings of her own child, although he was also in pain and scared. Surprisingly, it was Roger's illness that brought Evie back to life. He was hospitalized with pneumonia. Nina tearfully came to her sister to share the bad news. She blamed herself for not taking proper care of her nephew. He has a high fever and delirium. At first, the doctor and I thought it was the stress because his father had died and his mother was in an incomprehensible state. But it became obvious that it was much more serious. He was in intensive care for 24 hours. He's better now, but the doctor says it's too soon to relax. And you are drinking here, Evie? It's time to get back to life. We can't bring Phil back, but we can lose the boy. This situation literally awakened Evie. She became more afraid for her son than she had ever been in her life. She gathered herself, stopped drinking, resumed her job, and became a caring and loving mother once again. Every day, Evie visited her son in the hospital. Roger somehow grew up at once, trouble had turned a seven-year-old boy into a little old man with sad eyes. He was remarkably thin, pale, and silent. Looking at her son, Evie realized how deeply he was traumatized, her child needed a strong mother. While she had been consumed by her own grief, forgetting about the little boy who needed her support. Since then, Evie became an ideal mother, attentive, fully focused on her son, and caring. Due to the high cost of renting an apartment in the city, Evie couldn't afford to stay there. She decided to return to the village. Besides, her father passed away from a heart attack two years prior, and her elderly mother needed support and help with household chores as she struggled to manage on her own. So moving back to the village was a practical choice for Evie. 
Roger started attending the village school, and Evie found a job as a teacher there. However, she soon had to consider changing jobs due to the significant difference in salaries between the village school and the city gymnasium. She couldn't sustain herself and her child on such wages. So she had to find a way to support them both. And then her neighbors suggested a suitable option. Her nephew had a shop in the central market in the city. He sold clothes, shoes, and accessories, and he needed a salesman. The man promised a good salary and offered a percentage of the proceeds. The schedule also satisfied Evie. It's hard, of course, to part with my dream job of teaching kids. This was my true calling. But what can you do when times are hard? Evie said with deep regret as she left her school. She missed her students, colleagues, and school life. For a long time, her heart sank every time she saw children dressed in uniform on the street. But new realities awaited Evie, demanding customers who didn't know what they wanted, rivals causing scandals, and financial responsibility. The road always took a lot of time and effort. On her workdays, Evie had to wake up before dawn and walk almost two kilometers to the nearest bus stop that would take her to the city. Only the salary brought joy now. Evie could buy her son beautiful clothes and toys, and they even flew to the seaside resort every summer. Eve's mother helped to look after Roger. She was already elderly, of course, but she had enough time and energy for her grandson. Evie often visited Nina, who didn't work and took care of the house and her daughter. She could afford it, as her husband earned enough to provide for the family. That's how your fate turned out. You work like a horse, spinning as hard as you can. I even feel embarrassed that I'm a housewife, and you, everyone has their own destiny, Nina remarked. Eve sighed, I'm not complaining about mine. Roger and I have everything, so why whine in vain? Evie was genuinely happy about the way Nina's life had turned out. She adored both her sister and her niece, Molly. And the four of them often went out together. It was Nina who advised Evie to save up some money and invested in shares of a large IT company. Phil says it's the right thing to do. We ourselves have a lot of money invested in these shares. My husband is sure that everything will turn out great in the end. And Phil is smart. He knows, Evie listened to her sister and, without telling anyone, bought several shares. The capital grew, but very slowly. It was impossible to get rich with such interest as it seemed at the beginning. But Evie decided to keep the dividends in the deposit. She didn't tell her son or her mother about the shares. It is unlikely that they would approve and say that it is all a waste of money. Let the relatives live in peace. So Evie had her own little secret. Now she was saving money, sometimes buying shares, and saving for a happy future for her son. Roger grew up as a smart and athletic guy. Unlike his modest and quiet father, Roger was the life of the party. He always had many friends and companions. The guy went out a lot, laughed, and socialized. He was a very cheerful and carefree person. Evie, looking at her son, rejoiced. What a man he had become, confident, brave, and smart. He was precisely the kind of son she and Phil had pictured when they walked around the neighborhood with a stroller. Roger dreamed of becoming a lawyer, but he couldn't get into law school and had to go to the army. Returning, he decided to try his luck in the city. His mother supported her son's decision and even helped financially and rented Roger an apartment. Go and do it. Just be careful and know what you're getting into, and remember, you can always come back home here, to this house. Thank you, Mom, Roger smiled, but I'm not going back. I'm going to make my way in the city. There are so many opportunities and prospects there, something will work out. Good luck, Sonny. God bless you, smiled Evie. It was scary to let her son go, but what else could she do? The boy had grown up and it was time for him to start his own life. Finally, Roger enrolled in a law school, as he often wished, and also got a part-time job at the plant. He studied, worked, and started paying the rent by himself. He often visited the village to see his mother and grandmother, and he always brought gifts and shared funny stories. Eve's mother had completely given up. She hardly ever left the house and sometimes didn't even recognize her own daughters. 
One day, she had a heart attack, and Evie called an ambulance. Her mother was taken to the hospital, but she never came back. What? What do you want? It's an age, the doctor sighed tiredly. No one is eternal. After the funeral, then Nina told Evie to take their parents' house for herself. I don't need half of the inheritance, you know. And you, you've been taking care of mom for the last few years, and it's hard work, so it's fair that you get the house. Evie didn't object, she really needed her own corner as old age approached. She was sometimes surprised at how quickly her life flew by. It seemed that just yesterday she and Phil had a baby, plans, and hopes, and now Roger was an adult, independent man. Phil was not alive, and she herself was already almost an elderly woman. What's ahead? Only retirement and a quiet, peaceful existence in a country house. The only hope was Roger, he would get married, have children, then all would come to visit her, then there would be joy in life again. Although Nina tried to convince Evie that now was the perfect time to live for herself, you're still young and beautiful. Roger has grown up, now you can treat yourself. Your salary is good, and you even have savings. Let's go to Italy or Greece, you've never been abroad. Let's take a vacation. Greece? Italy? Evie smiled in response. I have a grown-up son who will soon get married, he will need help with the wedding and the apartment, that's what I'm saving up for. I can't rest now. Exactly. Your son is a healthy, grown-up man, he'll manage on his own. And you need to think about yourself sometimes, but Evie didn't agree with her sister. It's easy for Nina to talk, having such a husband, they were born with a silver spoon in their mouth and were well provided for for the nearest 100 years. True, her niece was a good girl, despite her wealthy parents, she grew up wise, modest, and sensible. She was also independent like Roger, and she had been working from an early age. Meanwhile, when Evie argued with her sister that Roger would need her support in the foreseeable future, she was totally right. Soon after this conversation, Roger came to his mother's house for the weekend, appearing mysterious and not his usual self. Evie immediately sensed that something was wrong. The woman quickly prepared the table with her son's favorite treats, fried potatoes with mushrooms and pickles from the cellar. She watched with pleasure as Roger devoured everything. Once he had eaten his fill, the young man shared the wonderful news with his mother, Mom, I'm getting married. Evie exclaimed, her son's flailing, when? To whom? The questions poured out of her like a waterfall. The woman felt a mixture of emotions, joy, anxiety, surprise. Her name is Cindy, you're sure to like her. I'm bringing her here next weekend, I wanted to introduce you to her before we get married. I just wanted to warn you first, Evie nodded with a smile, she knew this moment would come sooner or later, but she still found herself caught off guard by the news. It turned out that Cindy worked as a waitress in a cafe where Roger used to have lunch, that's how they met. Cindy is also a village girl, Roger shared the details. She was raised by a single mother too, look how much we have in common. She came to the city and wanted to go to law school, that's another coincidence, isn't it? She also dreamed of working for the police, hoping to catch criminals, but she's so fragile and petite, what kind of policeman would she be? Unfortunately, she failed her college exams, she didn't want to return home to the village, what would she do there? She grew up in a small, remote village, and besides herself, her mother has five younger children, therefore, she got a job as a waitress in a cafe. How long have you two been together? He asked her son. Almost half a year, Roger smiled, and the mother realized from his smile that Roger was totally in love. Mom, she's wonderful, she takes care of me, cleans the house, and cooks. We've been living together for four months in my rented apartment. I proposed to her the other day. Evie sighed, I'm happy for you, son, but there are many things necessary to prepare for the wedding. You need to order the restaurant for the wedding, find outfits for the bride and groom, hire a host, plan the menu, and send out invitations. Mom, we've decided to skip all that, Roger replied simply, we'll just sign quietly at the registry office, and that's it. 
as you wish, Evie nodded. Long ago, she had imagined the ideal wedding for her only son. It would be a joyful celebration with a crowd of well-dressed guests, a lively toastmaster, a huge cake, and a table filled with delicious food. But if the young couple had decided otherwise, so let it be. After all, it was their special day. The following weekend, Roger and his bride came to visit Evie. Evie prepared a lavish table, making salads, frying meat, and creating elaborate appetizers. She was very nervous, wanting to please her future daughter-in-law and show Cindy how much she was welcomed in their home. Evie wanted everything to be perfect so that Roger wouldn't be ashamed of his mother later. Cindy turned out to be a slim girl of short stature. She had big dark eyes, thin eyebrows, and thick bangs. She dressed simply but tastefully, wearing an elegant blue dress and low-heeled shoes. At first, the guests and the hostess felt a bit awkward. Cindy looked around carefully and remained silent, seemingly shy to speak. It was only after a while that Evie realized that this modesty was just an act. Cindy was observing, choosing her behavior tactics, and drawing conclusions. Roger lightened the atmosphere at the table, cracking jokes, entertaining the ladies, and bringing up interesting topics of conversation. He was always lively, energetic, and sociable. Meanwhile, Cindy charmed Evie with her modesty and the way she looked at her fiancé. There was tenderness and love in her eyes. The feeling was mutual, as Roger responded to Cindy in the same way, holding her hand occasionally. Love and harmony prevailed between the young couple, and Evie was looking at them with joy in her heart. Soon, Roger and Cindy got married. Evie suggested that the young couple celebrate in a cafe, maybe not a full-fledged wedding, but they could still celebrate with their friends, right? She even set aside money for it because Evie had savings over the years of her work. She managed to put aside a certain amount of money, plus the shares bought on her sister's advice gave dividends and increased in price. Initially, Evie wanted to buy an apartment in the city, but then she realized that she lived quite comfortably in the village. It was peaceful, quiet, and surrounded by familiar and friendly people. She enjoyed the atmosphere of her village. Near retirement, the woman realized that she did not want to move anywhere, but she could. She had enough money for a small apartment. Only her sister, Na, knew about these savings. Evie didn't flaunt her wealth, not even telling her son. She wanted Rogers to grow up independent, to try to earn money for his own housing, and achieve something in life. If he faced difficulties, she would always be there to help him financially, but until then, she wanted him to pave his own way. The money was held in a bank account, some of which Evie had invested in stocks a few years ago, based on her sister's husband's advice. These funds were now generating a good income. For her son's wedding, Evie withdrew an amount from the account that she estimated would be enough for a luxurious holiday. She wanted to give a gift to the young couple. When her son visited next, she handed Roger a puffy envelope. Um, he exclaimed, looking inside, what a surprise. Where did you get it? I saved up, smiled Evie, use it to have a celebration, buy nice rings, dress, and suit, go to a restaurant with friends, treat yourselves, have fun. Thank you, Roger smiled, but maybe we should save the money for an apartment. Why? Both of you already earn enough for rent, and a wedding only happens once in a lifetime. Well, ideally, of course. I'm having problems with work, Roger admitted, they pay me not much, and the job is unstable. I'm worried I might get sick, and Cindy, she doesn't earn much either, she's a waitress, not making millions. Yes, my little son has grown up. He has his own adult problems now, the woman thought to herself. Financial concerns are natural, especially when thinking about supporting a family. I feel sorry for him, of course, but everyone goes through tough times, but she replied aloud, don't worry, son. When you finish your studies, you'll find a better job. You're a good boy, smart and handsome. You'll be educated too, any company would be lucky to have someone like you. They won't take me, Roger sighed even heavier. I was expelled. What? Evie gasped in shock. Why? For truancy, Roger said quietly. Evie almost cried. She had imagined her son as a successful, competent, and highly paid lawyer. This news came as a shock. That's it? 
Roger said with irritation, looking at his mother. I had to work a lot and missed classes. The accumulated absences caught up with me. I thought I could handle it, but I couldn't, so they expelled me. It's not a big deal, Evie composed herself. She needed to support Roger now. You'll bounce back, you'll learn. You're not the first or the last. I don't want to finish my studies, Roger burst out. I'm a grown man sitting in classes, it's ridiculous. I should be earning money instead of wasting time. Evie didn't argue with her son. He was not in the right state of mind. He would change his mind later. Education was necessary for a young man as it formed the foundation for building a career. She would definitely convey this to him, but now she needed to support and reassure him. Well, if you don't want a wedding, do whatever you want with this gift of mine, Evie nodded at Roger. Thank you, Mom, Roger smiled gratefully and happily. We could really use the money right now. I'm glad to help. You're all grown up and practical, others would happily spend the money on the wedding, but you're thinking about the future, Evie said after her son left. Evie was left at home with a heavy heart. She was now worried about Roger, he hadn't finished his studies, didn't have a stable job, and no housing, and now he was going to get married as well. If they had children, Roger would have to work unskilled labor from morning until night to support the family. This wasn't the future Evie had dreamed of for her only child. He's a grown man, he'll figure it out, Nina reassured her sister over the phone in the evening. Why are you worrying? You did everything that was required of you, now it's up to him. Maybe I should have given them money for an apartment, Evie suggested to Nina. It would make things easier for the young couple, at least they wouldn't have to pay rent. Let them pay, Nina objected. Don't you dare mention that money now. They'll sit on your necks and hang down their legs. Without counting on your money, they'll try to climb up, and maybe they'll succeed. You can always get them an apartment, it's not time yet. You're right, Nina, you're absolutely right, grinned Eve's sister. And you stop being upset. Come to visit us tomorrow, we'll go out together and again then. Nina, you're right, smiled Evie, thinking that what a blessing it is to have such a nice sister who will always support and cheer her up. After a while, Roger and Cindy got married. The ceremony took place at the registry office, and it was modest and quiet. There was only Eve, Nina, and Molly, and two of Cindy's girlfriends at the ceremony. Then the guests made a few toasts to the newlyweds at the nearby cafe, and after giving them gifts, they went home. Cindy had to start her shift, Roger also needs to go to his job, what a wedding, disappointedly sighed Evie, come on, young people don't care about that now, Nina casually waved away, as long as they live well. Whether Roger and Cindy lived well, Eve had no idea. Her son tried not to talk to her about it, and she was somehow embarrassed to ask. They occasionally came to visit her. Cindy behaved politely, but coldly and aloofly. Evie noted to herself that this seemed to be a good relationship between them. Roger's work was not going well. He changed jobs and employers searching for a decent income, but nothing seemed to work out in the long run. Finally, Roger gave up, tired of the hard work and constant disappointments. One day he suddenly came to his mother, unexpected. We can't afford to live in the city, he sighed. It's too expensive for us. We'll live with you for a while, if you don't mind. No, Evie shook her head in surprise. That's good, Roger nodded, in that case, we'll come next week. Evie was at a loss after her son's departure. Were they really going to live in the village? What kind of strange decision was this? There was no work in the village, so what did Roger and Cindy expect? However, Evie decided not to argue with her son. All right, let them give it a try. Maybe they're just looking for a way out of a difficult situation and considering the option of living in the village. Well, if it didn't work out in the city, maybe this could be a solution. Joint life with Roger and Cindy began with dividing the territory. Mom, we'll live in the living room, Roger said, surprised. Evie asked why. She had prepared a small bedroom for the young couple, thinking it would be the coziest and most private space for them to live quietly. Roger simply replied, 
because it's the biggest and brightest, doctor. Then, Evie realized that her son was just following Cindy's wishes. He always tried to please his wife in everything, loving her more than anything else, and the woman took advantage of that. At this time, Cindy immediately showed her true character to her mother-in-law, not even trying to pretend to be polite or modest. She found fault with everything Evie did, criticizing her cooking and the way she cleaned. Cindy often made contemptuous remarks to Evie. What? Why are you making so much noise with the dishes in the morning, disturbing my sleep? Your friends laugh too loudly. Couldn't you gather somewhere else in the evening? Evie was completely taken aback by her daughter-in-law's insolence. She wanted to remind the young troublemaker that she was a guest in her house and should behave more modestly, however, she held back for the sake of her son. She could see that Roger was deeply attached to Cindy, that he loved and idolized her. The young husband tried to fulfill every whim of his wife, and there were many whims. Roger couldn't handle it all and felt guilty. Cindy fueled this feeling of guilt in him, often mentioning the gifts of jewelry and lavish spending by the husbands and boyfriends of her acquaintances. Evie understood that Cindy was manipulating Roger, playing with his emotions and using him. However, Evie was still afraid to open her son's eyes to the situation because he was too blinded by love and passion. And if Cindy asked him to jump off a cliff, he would do it willingly. Roger got a job at the local sawmill. The work was hard and physically exhausting, but it paid well enough for him to periodically take Cindy to the city for shopping and dining out. The young wife herself didn't bother to work. Well, where can I find a suitable job here in the village, she sighed. I can't go to the city every day. I used to do it, Evie said. I didn't have a husband, I had a child to raise, so I would drive to the central market every day. Why are you comparing different times and situations? Cindy sighed lazily. First of all, I'm married, fortunately. After all, the responsibility for the family's financial support lies with the man, not the woman. Secondly, you're not rushing to have children. I think it's foolish to have them without a stable home. It's terribly irresponsible. And thirdly, I'm going through a difficult period right now. Do you think it was easy to work as a waitress on night shifts and deal with difficult customers? I need to recuperate and gather myself. Evie had many things she could say to her daughter-in-law, but she remained silent. She did it for the sake of her son's peace of mind. He was already going through a tough time, and she didn't want to add to his frustration. The longer Cindy lived with Evie, the more the woman realized that Cindy had no tender feelings for Roger. Her irritation, unpleasant looks, words, and gestures made that evident. There were many signs. Then why was Cindy still with Roger? The answer was simple. Who else would work so hard for her? Where else would she find someone so loyal and obedient? Roger's feelings for Cindy were rare, and the girl knew it. Confident in her own power, Cindy often behaved rudely with her mother-in-law right in front of Roger. Her arrogant and contemptuous gaze, along with her snide remarks and reproaches, made Evie feel unwanted in her own home. To have less contact with her daughter-in-law, Roger's mother started visiting neighbors herself and often stayed overnight at her sister's house, Nina. Of course, Nina advised her to put the insolent daughter-in-law in her place. After all, this is your house, Now shook her head. Remind her of that. Make her think about it. If you want, I can talk to her myself if it makes you uncomfortable. No, Evie waved her hands. Absolutely not. Roger is always on her side in everything, and I don't want to add to his frustration. Of course, Cindy often complained to her husband about his mother, portraying her in a negative light, and Roger really blindly believed everything his wife said. Mom, why are you picking on her? The son would sometimes start a conversation. Cindy is a wonderful woman. I love her. Don't think of her as an enemy. Try to make up. I didn't quarrel with her, Eve tried to justify herself. I try not to talk to her at all. She turns any conversation in her direction and makes me the number one enemy. That's the problem. Roger shook his head sadly. Cindy says you despise her. 
She feels ignored or criticized. Why do you make her work in the kitchen? Cindy has a hard time and she needs some rest. I was just reminding her to clean up her plate. No one is forcing her to work. On the contrary, I do everything in the house. Roger looked at his mother with a sad look and Evie realized that it was useless. He still wouldn't realize that his wonderful Cindy systematically turns the lives of her husband and mother-in-law into a nightmare. Maybe one day Roger will understand, but not now. Cindy masterfully turned Roger against his own mother, who had sheltered them in her house and provided for them. Most of Roger's salary went towards paying off loans in the city. The couple had managed to accumulate loans that they now had to repay. It was hurtful and painful. Evie saw no way out of the situation. She could only hope that Roger would eventually see the truth. Sometimes she wanted to kick the insolent girl out of the house, but that would mean losing her son forever. And to be honest, this house belonged to Roger when her mother died. Evie suddenly realized that such things usually happen. Yes, her mother was sick and needed help, but there were no signs of her leaving so soon. Evie thought about it a lot. After all, she might one day leave just as suddenly. And what about Roger? What if other claimants to his house show up, unexpected heirs, inheritance issues, relations with relatives? Anything is possible. To protect Roger, even Evie, who was the sole owner of the house at the time, wrote a deed of gift to her son. After that, her mind was at ease. Now, the house officially belonged to Roger, and he knew it. Although at the time, Roger never thought he would need the inheritance. He dreamed of settling in the city, buying a good apartment, maybe even a country house. Who knew it would turn out this way? Evie decided to be patient. If it weren't for Nina and her sensible advice, Evie would have long ago spent all her savings on an apartment in the city for the young couple. But her sister was right, now the woman understood it more than ever. Cindy didn't love Roger, it was obvious she was using him. If Roger were to buy an apartment, which would be considered jointly acquired property, the young wife would immediately demand a divorce and legally take half of the housing with her into her new life. And that would be a lot of money. Eve hoped that Roger wouldn't be blinded by this strange love forever. Someday he would see the truth, and when that happens, he would need money for his new life. Seeing that her sister was having a hard time, Na suggested that they go on vacation together. And why not? She persuaded Evie over the phone. We'll be sunbathing, swimming in the sea, going on excursions. It will be great. In the end, Evie gave in. She really needed a vacation from everything that was going on at home. Let them live in the house on their own, she said. Cindy will have to cook and clean. However, she's completely spoiled. She won't even wash her plates. She sits at home all day long, hanging out on her phone and watching soap operas. Of course, Cindy expressed her opinion about Evie's vacation. There is no money in the family, but some of us have money for sea resorts. She once replied to Roger's remark that his salary was cut again. But even a man with angelic patience and deeply in love with his wife couldn't stand it anymore. Cindy, what do you care? Mom's earned it, so she has the right to do whatever she wants, Roger said. Yes, what about us? We've never been anywhere with you before, and we'll earn money, I promise. The trip was wonderful. Evie and Nina rented a house in a village on the shore of the sea. The sisters walked a lot, swam in the waves, sunbathed, and went on various excursions. Evie once took a risk and realized a long-standing dream. She rode on a jet ski with a young and reckless driver. Spray in the face, dizzying speed, endless sea surface. Evie had never been so scared and had so much fun at the same time. The sisters even went to discos at night and danced as if they were young again. Thank you, Nina, for pulling me out. Evie was genuinely happy. It feels like I'm ten years younger. By the way, outwardly it looks that way, smiled Nina. You look rested and wonderful. And so it was. For the first time in many years, Evie liked herself in the mirror. She was tanned and refreshed. The main thing was that there was a shine in her eyes and life and energy in her face. 
Evie felt that all the problems were left behind, the capricious, demanding daughter-in-law, the unsettled life of her son, and the endless squabbles in the kitchen. There was a powerful reset. The woman felt strong, beautiful, and energetic. The world seemed bright and welcoming. Only good things were on her mind. One day, the sisters were laid at the beach, admiring the unusually large stars and the bright yellow moon, which left a clear path on the sea surface. It's so beautiful, Evie said. That's right, agreed Nod. It's a pity we have to go back tomorrow. I can't believe it. I like it here so much. Another life, another world. And at home, send them to rent their own place. Lena couldn't take it anymore. They're sitting on your neck, and this little brat is making a fool of yourself. Probably I should come to you and put things in order. Don't, Eve protested. It'll make things worse. It can't get any worse, grumbled Nina. Good evening, fair ladies, a low, pleasant voice sounded from somewhere behind them. Both women shuddered with surprise and turned around at once. In front of them stood a man, slender with elegant gray hair on his temples. He smiled charmingly and very friendly. He was wearing jeans rolled up to his knees and a loose black t-shirt. Despite this, the stranger looked quite stylish and attractive. Good evening to you too, Nina replied for both of them. Lovely evening, isn't it? asked the man, coming closer. Evie couldn't take her eyes off his smile, which made the stranger's face seem to glow. The man introduced himself as Jeffrey and said that he had just arrived here today and had checked into a room on the second floor of the cafe the sisters were having dinner there today. In this place, drinking wine, eating kebabs, and enjoying live music, Jeffrey immediately noticed the two beautiful single ladies at the table and followed them to the shore. I apologize if I startled you, and don't think I'm a frivolous adventurer. It's just that you both have such kind smiles, and I'd like to find some friends because I had come here all by myself. Then that's a bit of a problem, Nina shrugged guiltily. We're leaving tomorrow. There's a flight at lunchtime. That's too bad, Jeffrey's smile momentarily faded. Evie also felt sorry that they wouldn't have the opportunity to get to know the man better. Spending their vacation together as a trio would have been more fun and interesting. There was something special about Jeffrey, something that drew Evie to him. It was strange for her to feel this way. She hadn't ever felt like this in the last 30 years. Well, since that's the case, we only have one evening left, Jeffrey smiled again. So let's spend it cheerfully, so that we'll have something to remember later. I come here often, I'll show you some great places. You'll be thrilled. Are you with me? Evie was ready to agree immediately, but now, unlike her sister, remained cautious and didn't let herself get carried away by the charming stranger. When we're seeing you for the first time, she smiled sheepishly. I don't mean to offend you, but that's right. Jeffrey slapped himself on the back. Of course, there are all sorts of crazy people and criminals out there. Now I understand your concerns. Let's just walk along the embankment. There will be many people there. Not cheered up. Evie realized that her sister was relieved that Jeffrey wasn't offended. It was a wonderful walk. The sister and their new acquaintance talked and laughed incessantly. They learned that Jeffrey lived in the capital and owned a couple of stores there. Jeffrey also shared details about his personal life openly and without reservation. Jeffrey had become widowed when his daughter was only nine years old. He never remarried because his daughter didn't want a stepmother in their home. For Jeffrey, his daughter's wishes were law. In that respect, you and Evie are alike, now remarked. She also lives solely for her son, tolerating much for his sake. Is that so? Jeffrey looked at Evie with interest. Meeting his gaze, Evie felt a surge of emotions reminiscent of her youth. She even felt a warm flush. Well, that was in vain, Jeffrey continued. Years later, I realized that it wasn't the right approach. My daughter grew up somewhat spoiled, but she's doing well now. She found a husband who, like me, tolerates her whims. Unfortunately, they live abroad, so I'm all alone. 
I have work, I have friends, but still, after my daughter's departure, the house and my soul feel empty. The trio continue to enjoy themselves until the morning, feeling as if they had traveled back in time to their youth. Jeffrey showed genuine sympathy towards Evie, trying to please her occasionally as if by chance. He would hold her hand, and Evie wished that moment could last forever. As the sun began to rise, the sisters returned to their cottage. I don't want to part with you, Jeffrey, confessed Evie, looking directly at him. Then you should exchange phone numbers, Nina suddenly suggested. We had such a good time, maybe we can come back next year. We should stay in touch so we can plan a vacation together. It would be a lot of fun. That's a great idea, Jeffrey agreed. Dictate your number, Evie. Evie complied with Jeffrey's request, smiling. There was so much warmth and tenderness emanating from him that Evie wished she could disappear into that feeling completely. It was a pity they had met so late. Jeffrey quickly dialed Evie's number from his cell phone. That's it, he smiled. Now we've exchanged phone numbers, and we won't get lost. Great, nodded Evie. She knew perfectly well that this phone exchange meant nothing. The fairy tale that had almost begun would never really begin because tomorrow, no, today, she and Nina would fly home. There would be the cramped village house again, the disgruntled daughter-in-law, the weak-willed son. The problems didn't go away while she was away. As for Jeffrey, today he went out with them, today he'll find someone else, a man like he is not for her, too successful, too good. And of course, she was too old for such things. It's sad, of course, but it's the truth of life. Ah, how he was looking at you, smiled Nina when they were left alone. Oh, come on, Evie waved it off with a smile. She knew she would think of Jeffrey often now, his soft voice, his delightful manners, his beautiful eyes. And let that man forget about her the very next day. It didn't matter. Jeffrey, he played a huge role in her life, though he didn't even realize it. Evie didn't get home until the evening before the flight. She and Nina managed to take a nap for a couple of hours, but Evie still felt tired and broken. Sleepless night, flight, acclimatization. The windows in the house were wide open, from inside came the steady hum of the television. The evening news was on. Evie was about to enter the house with a smile when she heard Cindy's voice. She was obviously in the kitchen. How very simple, she was teaching someone, obviously Roger. She will appear soon enough. We'll send her to Mrs. Roop for milk, and while she's walking, we'll put her things outside the door. It's a piece of cake. We've agreed a hundred times. What are you worried about? Isn't that a bit harsh? Roger asked in an uncertain voice. She's my mother, it's her house, not hers, Cindy argued. You showed me the deed of gift, and if that's the case, why should I put up with her here? She's been harassing me nonstop. Roger, honey, I've told you many times, she wants to quarrel with us. You know I can't live with your mother anymore, so it's either me or her. All right, all right, Roger mumbled, conciliating. As agreed, so will we act. You just watch out, don't give any slack. We do everything right, we are standing up for personal boundaries. Evie stood under the window, neither alive nor dead. The meaning of the overheard conversation slowly came to her. She was going to be kicked out of the house, and Roger agreed to it. She couldn't expect such a betrayal. Evie took a few deep breaths to pull herself together, put on a cheerful look, and entered. Oh, hello, said Cindy, smiling lusciously. And we were expecting you a little later. A cab took me home quickly. I didn't even have an opportunity to look back, Evie answered merrily. I've brought you some presents, and I also have many impressions that I can't wait to share. Cindy diligently portrayed something like joy at the meeting. Roger was sitting next to her, slumped and silent, and Evie understood perfectly the reason for her son's sadness. Of course, it's not easy for him now, but he also can't put his exploded spouse in place. She has too much influence on him. Oh, Evie, Cindy splashed her hands. Could you go to Mrs. Roop for fresh milk, please? I have soup boiling on the stove, and I can't get away. 
Roger is exhausted from work, and he's sick. If you're not too tired, then no problem. Evie nodded and left the house, already aware of what awaited her upon her return. It was fortunate that she had overheard this conversation, at least she would have time to prepare for a serious talk with her son and his wife. Evie spotted her suitcases on the porch from a distance. They stood there abandoned, leaning against the wall, waiting for their owner. The hope that Roger would finally put a stop to his or vicious wife's actions vanished like smoke. The woman climbed to the porch steps and knocked on the door. There's a note, came Cindy's voice from inside. Read it and you'll understand everything. Goodbye. I don't want your note, said Evie. I want to talk to you. I want to look you in the eyes. Oh, in the eyes? The door swung open with a clatter and Cindy stood on the threshold. She gazed haughtily at Evie. Well, look if you want it so much. Cindy, why are you doing this to me? I tried to be your friend, didn't I? You're pissing me off. The young woman was furious. You're judgmental. Everything's wrong. Nothing is right for you. You make your own rules. I don't feel like I belong here, and Roger is foring over you. Well, this is my house, Evie gently reminded her. So, it's natural that I give the orders here. There you go again, Cindy exclaimed. You insinuate once again that we live in your house. And by the way, this is not your house, but your son's. So, it's you who lives with us. Get another place to live. You have a good pension, enough to rent something. Thank you for packing my things, said Evie calmly. It took a great deal of effort for her to remain calm. She would cry later, when she reached Nina's. Of course, she would go to her sister. Who else? But there aren't many of my things here. Just clothes. Where are the photo albums, old books, and letters? That junk. Nina sighed heavily. We threw it out. Oh no, Evie gasped. It felt as if she had been punched in the stomach. This was her family's history, old photographs, letters from Phil and her parents, postcards, diaries kept by Nina and Evie in their youth, the first drawings of Molly and Roger. All of it had been carefully stored in boxes and folders, neatly arranged on the shelves of the bedroom rack. Isn't there anything left? asked Evie, with hope. Cindy defiantly looked at her mother-in-law. What's the point of clinging to junk? the insolent woman grinned. What good are these dusty papers? It's even easier to breathe without them. Despite her condition, Evie suddenly had a brilliant idea. She had to suppress a smile to avoid giving herself away. Cindy would no longer feel like the one in control. In just a couple of minutes, the smug expression would vanish from her pretty face. So, you threw everything out of my room, right? Absolutely. It's going to be our walk-in closet, Cindy affirmed. Every single box. Did you look inside? Cindy suddenly tensed up. Were there any important documents or something? The documents can be gotten in case of an emergency, Evie replied wearily, sinking on the porch step. The blue shoebox was thrown away too, right? I think so. Why does it matter? Cindy suddenly looked worried. Because, Evie looked up at Cindy, the fact, my dear, is that my savings were in the blue box. The money I had set aside to buy an apartment for Roger. Her words had an incredible effect. Cindy was stunned, turned pale, opened and closed her mouth a few times, trying to say something. Then she powerlessly sank on the step next to Evie. Why didn't you warn me, she whispered. Evie was satisfied with the effect of the phrase. She didn't keep any money in a blue shoebox, it was safely lying in her account, slowly growing. But Cindy needed to be taught a lesson for all the bad things she had done to Evie and Roger. How could I have known you would throw my things out of the house? I couldn't even imagine such a thing, the woman stubbornly played the role of a confused and bewildered old lady. Cindy shook her head, as if she had just woken up from a dream. Her eyes filled with eagerness for action. Now you're going to tell me everything in detail. What did this box look like? What shade of blue was it? 
Was it big or small? Questions were pouring out of Roger's wife as if from a never-ending source. Evie answered, trying not to get confused in her testimony. The situation began to amuse her. Roger had stayed at home the entire time, not even sticking his nose out on the porch. He was probably ashamed of the fact that he went along with his wife and drove his mother out of the house. But he couldn't oppose his wife, he loved her too much, and Cindy took advantage of that. After answering all of Cindy's questions, Evie wandered to the bus stop. Come on, stay, the daughter-in-law muttered. Now she needed her mother-in-law, now to help her in the search. The young woman was determined to find that box, even if it meant searching in a landfill or at the end of the world. And Evie could help her, she knew what a receptacle for a large sum of money looked like. Why should I? Evie was a little surprised. What do you mean, why? We have to look for the box of money together. Don't you care about the fate of your savings? That's where you're wrong, Evie smiled. I don't care what happens to this money. I was going to give it to you anyway. If you find it, take it. Evie was walking along her familiar street and felt that Cindy was watching her. Yes, her daughter-in-law had experienced a real shock, thinking that she had thrown away such a large sum of money with her own hands. Now she would dig her nose into the ground to bring this wealth back home. Before going to the bus stop, Evie went to see Brooke, with whom she had a good relationship. She needed someone in the village who could keep an eye on Cindy and inform her about what was going on, and Brooke was the most suitable person for the role of informant. At first, Brooke was indignant and shocked, listening to Eve's story. She couldn't comprehend how they could do that to Evie. But after hearing the whole story, Brooke burst into loud and merry laughter. Well, Evie, you're crazy. That's a real revenge. Brooke, I'd like to know how things are going with them, Evie smiled. How are they living? How is this search progressing? Something tells me that this story will open Roger's eyes to his wife. Oh, Roger, Brooke shook her head. I didn't think you would turn out to be so weak. Love is cruel, Evie sighed as Brooke hit a sense of spot in her heart. Of course, I'll keep an eye on them. I'll also involve Wayne, you know how quick he is. Wayne, Brooke's 14-year-old son, was always glued to his phone, filming content for his channel. After Brooke, Evie went to see her sister. She knew that Nina would never abandon her, she would listen, support, and pity her. It was so good to have such a person. Two weeks had passed since Eve's return, and this short period of time was filled with significant events. First and foremost, Eve's plan had worked. Cindy was hooked. She discovered the location where the village's garbage was taken and started visiting the dump daily, almost as if it were her job. Brooke regularly reported to Evie by phone about Cindy's trips. She turned out to be an excellent informant. Oh, Evie, it's quite a spectacle. She goes to the bus stop in the morning, eagerly awaiting the first bus. She looks like a tourist, carrying a huge backpack filled with overalls, gloves, and bags. It's all very serious. And in the evening, she returns tired, disheveled, and angry. She smells absolutely awful, animals run away from her, and people cringe, Brooke shared the news with Evie. It was not limited to stories about Cindy's adventures. Brooke's son sometimes followed Cindy on his bike and filmed videos of her diligently sifting through mountains of garbage. Then he usually sent these videos to Evie. Cindy meticulously combed through the dump day after day, not missing a single square meter. It appeared comical, but Evie couldn't help but feel a little sorry for her daughter-in-law, or better to say, almost ex-daughter-in-law, because Roger had filed for divorce. Evie first learned from neighbors that Roger had left home. Then her son called her, apologizing and expressing remorse, but also informing her of the divorce with Cindy. We're getting a divorce, Mom. I can't go on with her. She must be crazy. Let her stay at the house for now. I gave her a week because she has nowhere else to go. Cindy still keeps hoping to find money. It's become an obsession for her. She blames me while she's ruining herself. It's unbearable. And what will you do in the city? 
I finally found a good job. I'll have to go on business trips. But I don't care. It's good money. After the conversation with her son, Evie felt better. It was important to her to stay connected with her son. Now there were no conflicts or misunderstandings between her and Roger. It seemed that things were improving for him. He found a job, and he was getting away from Cindy, who had openly taken advantage of him. Maybe he would soon meet a good woman and find happiness in his personal life. After all, he still had time. Evie hoped that the relationship with Cindy would serve as a valuable lesson for Roger, and he wouldn't fall into such a trap again. The most pleasant thing in Evie's life happened a week after she arrived at her sister's house. She received a call from Jeffrey. He confessed that he couldn't forget their meeting and had been constantly thinking about Evie, dreaming of seeing her again. It was incredible. Evie had never imagined that such a man would truly fall in love with her, but it seemed that he had. Jeffrey frequently called and wrote to her, they communicated extensively, and gradually, they became close. Yes, it was a long-distance connection, but Evie felt that both of them needed this communication. So, when Jeffrey expressed his desire to come to Evie, she offered to fly to him herself. There was nothing to keep her here. Evie had the money for the trip, the very money she had saved for an apartment for her son. But now she was sure that Roger should earn his own living, and she had not long to live. She decided to cherish every moment of it. Of course, she had come to understand this in her retirement, but it's never too late to realize it. In general, Evie was embarking on a long journey. She went shopping with Nina, bought beautiful things, and felt genuinely happy. However, before leaving, there was one final task that Evie needed to complete, an unpleasant yet necessary conversation with Cindy. It was enough for her to be the queen of the garbage dump. Let her start a new life too. Thank you for joining us today on Deep Stories. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next video.